Welcome, welcome. Um, uh, I'm Ted Peterson. I'm a professor of computer science at the University of Minnesota Duluth and today is Thursday, April 28th, 2016. And uh, what I'm going to try and do today is present a uh, fairly long history of computing uh, starting back as early as the 1600s and, and work our way to the present day. Um, I think in this uh, particular video I'm going to try and get up to the beginning of the age of commercial computing um, which is just a little bit after World War II and so we'll kind of cover the period before that um, and um, I'm doing this for a few different reasons one is to serve as a, um, a review tool for a computer architecture class I'm teaching uh, and I could it could also be a preview tool for future offerings of that class I imagine and may hopefully also just be something of general interest. Um, so that's what this is about. That's, that's why we're here. Um, so computing, calculating have been things that human beings have needed to do for a long time. As, as, as our world has grown more and more complicated and we have more and more things to keep track of, uh, more and more businesses to engage in commerce, taxes to be paid and things like that, calculating and computing um, have grown in importance and that was true long ago. And in early days, you know, thousands of years ago, of course we had devices like the abacus that would help us uh, doing calculations. Um, humans are adept at mathematics but not at large uh, problems, uh, large numbers, columns of numbers, adding them up or doing other operations in our heads. So we've always aspired to have some kind of aid for that. And so um, it's really when we get to the 1600s when we start to see the development of mechanical calculating uh, tools or mechanical calculators and um, there was a kind of interesting little flurry of development in the in the uh, kind of early 1600s that um, really um, uh, kind of ushered in the, the a, a kind of desktop computing if you think of it these were these were calculators designed to assist with uh, operations like addition and subtraction um, possibly multiplication and division and um, they were um, uh, very simple uh, in, in some respects um, in, in terms of their aspirations but, um, but kind of got us started. Um, and so one of the other things that happened in the 1600s, early 1600s, that's really important, has kind of a lasting impact on computing, was the either the invention or discovery of logarithms. And that kind of depends on how you, you view mathematics and mathematical principles if they're discovered or invented. But whatever the case, in 1617, uh, uh, John Napier uh, published uh, the idea of logarithms, which he had developed earlier. And logarithms are important for computing and calculating because they provide a wonderful mechanism for simplifying calculations. It's possible to do multiplication and division uh, by using logarithms uh, and, and then you only need to do addition and subtraction. So uh, uh, th that's multiplication and division are typically more difficult and so we can convert multiplication and division problems into addition and subtraction problems through the use of logarithms. And that's had a lasting impact on, um, on, on the development of computing, particularly in these early days. Um, and so um, uh, the um, uh, period uh, in, the, in the early 1600s featured both the development of logarithms and the development of some of the first uh, uh, calculators that we saw, desktop calculators if you will. Um, the first probably uh, was by um, Wilhelm Schickard and uh, he, uh, his calculator dates to about 1620 and it featured the use of um, uh, among other things, Napier's bones. And Napier's bones were developed by John Napier, the inventor of the logarithm, uh, as, a, as an aid for doing multiplication and division. And they weren't precisely related to logarithms, but they're, they're quite clever and involve just moving uh, the bones or sticks uh, back and forth uh, to, to aid in calculation. Um, they are um, uh, just a, a device for making it simpler to do multiplication and um, 
division, uh, essentially reducing those to addition and subtraction problems. So similar in spirit to the idea of a logarithm. Um, and um, uh, we also had uh, from Blaise Pascal, uh, famous Blaise Pascal, uh, a, a calculator and date, that dates around 1642. And that one of that's one of that calculator's principal innovations may have been the use of uh, complement arithmetic, nines complement, uh, where you can essentially take a subtraction problem and turn it into an addition problem through the use of complement notation. Now that was important because both Schickard's and Pascal's uh, calculators had gears, uh, wheels in them that would move around uh, to represent numbers, you know. So if it's five plus five, you have one one gear moving five, and another one moving five, and somehow representing ten. Um, if you have to do subtraction with those same gears, you got to move them the other way, and that makes for a somewhat more complicated design. And so um, the the use of nines complement allowed for this calculator to do subtraction simply by doing addition. So kind of a similar sort of uh, intuition uh, as we see with logarithms where we want to take a more complicated operation or movement and um, through the clever use of mathematics simplify it. Um, certainly that's what Blaise Pascal did. And Blaise Pascal was a pretty clever mathematician in other ways, so no surprise. Um, we also have a, um, a, a machine that is not clearly dated, but it's credited to uh, Leibniz, the, one of the co-inventors of calculus along with Isaac Newton. And somewhere during his life, he built a number of different kind of calculators. Uh, and uh, he was alive um, from 1646 to 1716. So somewhere in that period, he was doing this work. And his um, uh, calculator featured uh, the stepped drum, which was an alternative to these wheels or gears. It was a drum that would turn and um, carry out um, allow you to represent numbers uh, as the drum rotated and uh, to carry out calculations. Um, so these machines, these are representative of the kinds of calculating devices we saw in that era. They were hand powered, they were handmade. It's important to remember that um, there was not really a kind of industrial infrastructure manufacturing gear, gears and wheels and so on and so forth. So, so they were a bit difficult to make and they were rather delicate to use and so, so really didn't have a, a, a major impact. Um, they're important, though, because they show uh, a desire to uh, simplify calculation through mechanical means. And I think it's also important that we see some of the foremost mathematicians of the age involved in their creation. I mean, this is, you know, Pascal and Leibniz had plenty of other interesting work to do, but to them, this was a priority. This was important. And so they spent some of their very valuable time on the development of these kinds of devices. And, and, and so I think uh, that, that just kind of tells us something about uh, uh, the motivations um, and the desire for these kinds of devices. Um, one of the challenges for these devices, too, was especially the ones using gears, is that as, as you try to represent more and more numbers, if, if you had 10 numbers represented by 10 gears, and let's say you had some kind of a carry propagation, like if you have 99999 plus 1, you have a carry across all the digits. And that carry had to be represented in those gears. And so the force of those propagating carries was a limit to these kinds of calculators. Um, if too many digits, too much force and it would break or become unreliable. And so these machines were typically limited to, you know, maybe six or seven digits of precision um, because of that. Um, now, we um, don't see, uh, uh, you know, we see kind of incremental progress from the 1600s into the 1700s with these kinds of uh, uh, calculating devices. And we don't see any really big um, uh, events um, until we get into the mid 1800s, early to mid 1800s, and this is where we we encounter Charles ba Charles Babbage and his difference engine, and then the analytical engine, and and Charles Babbage is one of the kind of extraordinary figures in computing. Um, he was a a wealthy man and and quite a um, a social uh, butterfly, uh, hosting many parties and soirees. He was. Uh, apparently a rather difficult man. He was uh, a man of 
of, of, of unreasonable principle. Uh, and, and so um, he, he would adopt a hard line on whatever position it might be and was fearless in being critical. He was famous for being very critical of the scientific community in England. And in some cases, he had reasonable points, but he made those points in such a kind of brutal way that he didn't necessarily make a whole lot of friends. Um, he was, however, a, a, he was not a crank. I mean, he was a, 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 a smart, maybe even brilliant man. For uh, some period of his life, he was the Lucasian professor of mathematics at Cambridge University. Uh, that's, a, that's the chair that Isaac Newton occupied, that Stephen Hawking occupied. So, I mean, he's in pretty illustrious company there. And um, so he's, a, he's just a real interesting personality, um, in addition to being a, a really extraordinary designer and thinker of computing devices. Um, now, Charles Babbage began working on his difference engine in the 1821. And we have to think back to that time a little bit and understand what were people concerned with, especially in terms of computing. And one of the things that um, had developed by that time. Remember logarithms developed uh, 1617. By the 18 1800s, tables of logarithms were crucial tools in all kinds of areas. Um, one of the notable ones was navigation. Um, the, the ships, the, the navigators on ships would have tables of logarithms and compute charts based on the position of stars and so forth. And they would use the tables of logarithms to simplify their calculations. If there were errors in those tables, that would throw the root of a, of a ship off uh, in, in a way that might be catastrophic and even life-threatening or life-ending. And so um, it, it logarithms, these tables of logarithms were used everywhere, and it was crucial they be accurate. Now, at that time, tables of logarithms, the, the logarithm values were computed by hand, they were typeset by hand, and, and then printed, and there were all kinds of places along the way where errors could creep in, errors of calculation, errors of typesetting, and um, there was, it was really extremely difficult to control for that. And the story goes that um, uh, Charles Babbage and, and John Herschel, his, his great friend John Herschel, the great astronomer, uh, were together checking uh, the validity or the correctness of some logarithm calculations. And, and, um, and Babbage is, is said to have uttered something along the lines of, I, 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 I certainly wish this, uh, this could be done by steam. Um, and uh, this checking of the logarithms could be powered by steam. And that, again, remember at the, at the time, uh, in the 1800s, steam power was sort of the state of the art, and it was kind of a, uh, a remark born of frustration, but then uh, we can see in his uh, analytical engine in particular this notion of a steam-powered calculating uh, and computing device, uh, which is really kind of an extraordinary thing to think about, I think, from this day and age. Um, so Charles Babbage began um, his, his, his work in, in kind of automating calculation and computation with the difference engine. And it's important to remember the difference engine and the analytical engine are two different things entirely. Uh, it's also important to remember he had numerous designs of his difference engines and the analytical engine, and it is equally important to remember, and, and it's somewhat sad, that none of these machines were ever built. They weren't built in his lifetime. A uh, small demonstration of the difference engine was constructed, but these machines were not built. They were designed on paper, and um, in the uh, 19... 90s, uh, 1980s, 1990s, there was a, a project uh, in, in England uh, to, to build one of the difference engines uh, that in fact was successful. And that, uh, that, that's the story of that is recounted in a, a very fine book by Doran Swade uh, that uh, uh, describes both the history of the difference engine and then its reconstruction. Um, and um, so, um, so, so while they weren't constructed during his lifetime, we have seen in modern times that indeed the designs were reasonable. And um, so, and we have working difference engines now, I believe two, uh, that um, uh, are available in various museums and places. Um, 
So the goal of the difference engine was fairly straightforward. It, it wanted to automate the calculation of, um, of polynomials. And it did this through the method of finite differences. And the method of finite differences is another kind of clever mathematical tool, uh, or trick even, that lets you uh, calculate uh, the values of polynomials simply by using addition. And it's, it's very lovely, very elegant, and very reasonable to implement. And so um, the, um, the difference engine um, consists of um, really just columns of wheels that represent different polynomial terms. And um, the calculation of the method of finite differences is such that you can actually parallelize that. And so there's, 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 there's actually uh, probably the first instance of, of parallel computing uh, to be found in the difference engine. Um, uh, there's um, the, 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 the design um, of, of the um, difference engine uh, featured not just parallelism, but there was a carry look-ahead mechanism. There was a lot of fault tolerance. Uh, the engineering and, the, and the, the thought that went into it was, was really quite extraordinary. Um, Charles Babbage was also, he was, as, as I mentioned before, he was kind of a man of unreasonable principle. He was also a man of unreasonable precision. Um, his expectation of these difference engines and his analytical engine was to have precision of like 30, 40, 50 digits. And these are decimal digits. I mean, so he is envisioning doing calculations with 30 decimal digits, numbers that have 30 digits, um, which is extraordinary. These are big numbers. And, um, you know, certainly if we look back to the 1600s, what we see there are these devices that are doing five, six, seven digits. So it's a big jump. Um, it may have been part of his undoing. Uh, he had grand ambition. And, um, uh, and, and this led to uh, many design challenges and, um, and also people perhaps questioning. Um, well, do we really need a machine that calculates uh, values of 50 decimal digits? Do we really need that? Um, and so, um, so, so Charles Babbage was not perhaps the most pragmatic of men. Um, the difference engines uh, are, are large. Uh, these are these are eight to ten feet tall. Uh, they, um, you know, they they go beyond the reach of my arms, um, and they weigh, you know, in the order of five tons. Um, and uh, there are some lovely videos of the difference engine in action, the reconstructed difference, en difference engines in action, that are worth watching just to see how it looks. Uh, but the difference engine was actually powered by a crank. So the difference engine was not steam powered. It was human crank powered and, um, uh, and, and, and worked quite, quite well. Um, it's important to say the difference engine was not a computer. It was a special purpose calculator. Um, and it was really only the ana analytical engine that um, we would consider a computer. And we will get to that next. Um, but one of the other things about the difference engine, again, Charles Babbage was thinking of these tables of, of logarithms and other tables of results. And so his difference engine included not just a calculating mechanism, but a typesetting and printing mechanism. So that once a result was calculated, it would be automatically typeset and printed, thus eliminating um, many sources of errors in the generations of these tables, kind of a, an idea of kind of tables uh, on demand. Um, and um, you know, really quite thorough and, and sort of visionary in its thinking. It's not enough just to calculate a value correctly. You have to get the output represented in some form correctly. And you can't rely on humans to do that. You know, certainly not. Um, so, Charles Babbage worked on his difference engines roughly in the period 1821 to 1833. 1833, he abandoned the difference engine. And there were a number of factors for that. Uh, one, probably the most significant, is a monumental dispute with uh, his kind of chief engineer who was hand tooling all of the wheels and gears and things like that. And it was just a dispute over money and location of, of, the, of the workshop. and. Uh, you know, Charles Babbage was a, a, a very wealthy, you know, probably autocratic 
man who was ordering this skilled, uh, the skilled engineer around as, a, as perhaps a common laborer, or who knows exactly. But they had a significant falling out, and uh, the difference engine was abandoned. It's also pretty clear that by that time, um, Charles Babbage had potentially lost interest in the difference engine. He had explored it mentally as far as he felt he could or should, and um, his mind had moved on, and he'd moved on to something much grander, and that was the analytical engine. Um, now, the analytical engine um, is indeed a computer. Uh, it has a uh, uh, it features a number of different components. There's a mill and a store. The mill is where calculations go, so that's very analogous to our modern uh, CPU, central processing unit. unit. The store is where data was um, kept, uh, so very much like our memory. Uh, uh, there were input and output via punched cards, uh, which is something we saw in computing up until the 1950s, 1960s. Um, there were even um, uh, barrels outside of the mill that would uh, take, uh, they, would, they would receive the operation codes from operation cards and, and move uh, in such a way to, to manipulate the mill. And so represent really a first instance of microprogramming, a uh, concept that you know, we see again and again in later development of computing. Um, the, the, um, the analytical engine has operated um, very much like what we would consider a fetch-execute cycle, where an instruction is read into the processing unit, data is taken from memory uh, into the processing unit as well to be operated on, and, and, and that's the fetching, and then the operation is performed, that's the execute, and then the result is written back out into the store of the memory. So, um, I mean, in effect, we have a, a, a very modern conception of, of a computer, much like a stored program computer, um, which is a theme that we will um, see over and over again. The stored program computer um, is one of the great monumental ideas um, in computing. It's, it, just to preview a little bit, it's the idea that your instructions and data um, reside together and can be treated somewhat interchangeably. Um, and um, we'll develop this idea as we go along, but it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a major theme in the history of computing, and it's very important to have a clear sense of what a stored computer, um, a stored program computer is, and where we see that and where we don't see that uh, in, in the development of computing. Um, now, the analytical engine was envisioned to be powered by steam, and it was going to be mechanical. And this work started in 1834. And one of the, one of the kind of intriguing parallels uh, that um, we can think about is that the electromechanical relay was invented in 1835 by Joseph Henry. And this became the um, primary way that telegraph and telephone were, um, were implemented. Uh, via electromechanical relays. These are just, you know, basically little um, magnetic switches that, you know, based on having power on or off, a, a, a gate would open or close to let more uh, or less current through. And electromechanical relays, we'll see, became a key tool in computing in the 1930s. And it's just kind of intriguing to think about, well, what if Charles Babbage had known about electromechanical relays and used those in his design instead of gears and so on and so forth? Uh, I mean, it's you know, there's there's no. It took a few years to develop electromechanical relays, and there's no in indication that Joseph Henry and Charles Babbage knew each other. So that's more of a kind of an alternate history sort of concept to think about. But it's an interesting parallel. Um, so um, uh, the analytical engine again, unreasonable amounts of precision, like fifty decimal digits of precision, and the store was expandable. So the store could be, as you could store as many digits as you wanted. In the store you had basically one column of gears for each digit, um, uh, uh, each, um, each number that you were storing. So each wheel would represent a digit. So you can imagine 50 wheels stacked on top of each other where each wheel is turned to the position 
uh, representing a digit. Uh, and in fact, there were two of those stacks, one on top of the other, uh, to help deal with some of the mathematical operations. Um, and um, uh, so, so this was big. And you could expand the store out as far as you wanted by adding more of these columns. Um, and so in his designs, the analytic, uh, analytical engine was conceived of being perhaps about 15 feet high and 45 feet long. I mean, it's just enormous. Um, and powered by steam. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a vision of kind of Victorian England that I think is really is so intriguing. Uh, and there's a wonderful graphic novel. I normally I don't typically like graphic novels, but there's a wonderful sort of graphic novel by Sidney Padua that um, is the thrilling adventures of Lovelace and Babbage, I think. And it envisions Babbage and Lovelace actually creating their machine and then having adventures based on it and so forth. So it's, it's great fun. Um, and I just introduced there the, the very famous Ada Lovelace, um, who indeed uh, became colleague of Charles Babbage. And they met uh, apparently in 1833. Uh, Ada Lovelace was a wealthy young woman. Uh, she met Charles Babbage when she was a teenager. He was a man in his early 40s. Um, but they apparently had some affinity. Ada Lovelace was a, a bright, curious um, young woman uh, who was um, apparently, the story goes, saw Charles Babbage doing a demonstration of his difference engine. And she was kind of entranced by it and understood it in a way that many people don't. And so they began to correspond and um, developed a, uh, a working relationship that lasted a number of years. Um, now Ada Lovelace um, perhaps is, is now more famous than Charles Babbage. She is recognized with Ada Lovelace Day, which is December 10th. Uh, and, and she is kind of an iconic figure for uh, women in computing and is often, uh, often regarded as the first programmer. Um, and, uh, and, and so her role, her role in the development of the analytical engine is, um, there, there's some debate and discussion about that, but there are some things she did that are important and, and essentially incontrovertible. And, and one of the characteristics that Charles Babbage had, which did not serve him well, is that he didn't write very much about his difference or analytical engines. He wrote about everything else. He wrote book after book after book about economics, about accounting, about insurance, about his life. Even in his autobiography, there's very little discussion of really his masterwork, you know, the difference engine, the analytical engine. For whatever reason, he was not moved to write about it. If Ada Lovelace had not been on the scene, we would know far less than we do about the difference engine and the analytical engine. And um, uh, her, um, her contribution in that way is that Charles Babbage went to Italy uh, and gave a presentation, a very rare presentation, about the analytical engine. And there was um, one of the people in attendance, um, Menabria, uh, wrote, uh, kind of took notes, and then wrote a paper based on those remarks. Um, and, and the paper was just this description of the analytical engine. And he wrote it in, I think, French. Uh, and somehow Ada Lovelace uh, became the translator, uh, or offered to translate this perhaps, into English. And so she translated it into English, which was a suitable thing. You know, ladies of that era, translation was indeed an activity that they could be engaged with. And then she kind of went a little bit out of bounds, and she wrote extensive notes about the paper, footnotes, if you will. Footnotes are actually quite a bit longer than the paper itself, and they're wonderful. They're fascinating. And um, she um, introduced a lot of interesting ideas in those um, footnotes, um, and that's where we see the first program. Um, the very first programs for the analytical engine are described in that paper. Now we don't really have any other clear accounts of programs for the analytical engine, or the um, and and so 
Um, there's been some controversy apparently, well, she was just transcribing Charles Babbage's notes or whatever. And, and so it's probably not possible to completely sort that out. But the fact is she wrote something down when he didn't. Um, and if you're going to choose not to write things down, you're going to obfuscate, you know, kind of the history of things. And so um, at, at a bare minimum, Ada Lovelace must get great credit for simply um, taking the time and dedication to record all of this um, for us now. Um, so, um, in addition to the description of the first, um, these first programs, um, which which were, by the way, non-trivial. These were not hello world programs. These were um, a, si a solution of uh, simultaneous equations and computing um, Bernoulli, uh, the Bernoulli function. Uh, so these are, you know, these are not trivial programs, and um, and they're described in a stepwise fashion. There are tables that show essentially how the values of variables change as the calculation proceeds, and it's it's fairly straightforward to see that as a program. Um, and um, in addition to that, um, uh, she uh, included some um, remarks on computing, uh, and she was very clear that the, the difference engine is a whole different thing. That's not really a a, a computer, as we would say, it's just a, it's a very special purpose calculator. She was very clear about that, um, and she also, in talking about the analytical engine, envisioned its use with symbolic uh, computation, doing things like composing music, um, and that really seems to have come from her because Charles Babbage was a a, a kind of driven, pragmatic man, and he viewed the purpose of computation to deal with numbers. That's what it was about. And Ada Lovelace seems to have taken a, a, a more um, a modern view, actually. I mean, I mean, she envisioned the use of computers in ways that were not strictly uh, the use, uh, calculation of algebra and, you know, calculus problems. And as we look at the development of computing, it's really quite striking that early generations of computers really did just do math problems. They were for linear algebra and calculus and all the rest. And they weren't trying to do some of these grander problems, uh, which we only see more recently. Um, so, so I think she, she certainly deserves great credit for that. Um, Ada Lovelace um, had a number of interesting um, experiences in her, in her life. Uh, and one of them was she, um, uh, before writing uh, the paper uh, the, or translating the Manabrio paper and um, writing the footnotes, uh, she studied with um, De Morgan, uh, De Morgan's law fame, and, and this was in 1840. Um, and, and so, uh, and, and, and that was a correspondence class, if you will, and, and those letters and co that correspondence has been preserved. And, and she was a very inquisitive kind of student. She would ask question after question after question. And some people have been critical of her for that. Like, oh, well, she's asking such simple questions. She must not have been very smart. And it's kind of like, it's frustrating to see that, I think, because usually what we hear is, well, no, there's no such thing as a bad question or a dumb question, right? And then all of a sudden, well, you have someone here who's asking questions the way that you hope a student would ask questions, and then she's criticized for it. That, that just strikes me as kind of unfair. Um, and so, uh, so anyway, um, so um, just to position kind of where we are in time now, um, the, 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 the Manabria paper with a sketch of the analytical engine was published in 1843, um, and so uh, Ada Lovelace was 26, 27 years old. Um, it's important to recognize, too, that um, where were we at in terms of the, the sort of the theoretical foundations of computing? And it's like, well, there were, there were essentially none. Um, George Boole, uh, who gave us Boolean algebra, which is one of the core ideas of computing, uh, didn't publish that work until um, 1854. Uh, and so, so we're back before, really, we had the machinery, uh, the intellectual machinery, to talk about computing in, in, the, in the modern sense that we know it now. And yet, if you read her footnotes, which I, I highly recommend, there are very few kind of wrong notes 
Um, you know, sometimes you read something from a few hundred years ago and they'll, they'll make some preposterous claim that you, you kind of laugh at and say, well, yeah, they didn't know much back then. But really, as you read through it, it's all very plausible and it, 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 it feels um, uh, still quite fresh and contemporary. And so I think in general, her vision of what the analytical engine could do and what computing could do in general was really quite um, remarkable. I mean, I, I think I think I think that she deserves quite a lot of credit for that. Um, it's very hard to write something that you know, 200 years later, people are reading and feeling like, yeah, I, I get that. Uh, that that relates to how I understand computing too. Um, and so, um, the um, so Ada Lovelace, um, her primary um, her primary interactions with Charles Babbage were as a a correspondent, and it's not that she was helping him build the anal analytical engine, because nobody was building the analytical engine. He was doing it on paper, they were corresponding, um, and then she was working on this, this paper um, with um, uh, translating Manabria's work. Um, now sadly, um, uh, Ada Lovelace um, died quite young. She died when she was 36 years old, uh, the same age that her father, Lord Byron, died. Um, Lord Byron was quite the character, and Ada Lovelace was his only legitimate child. Uh, and um, uh, interestingly enough, Charles Babbage's beloved wife died at 36 as well, so uh, a, a difficult age, I guess. Um, and so, um, so Ada Lovelace, um, in addition to um, towards the end of her life, uh, she had some... Um, uh, vision of uh, wanting to work out a calculus, uh, a calculus of the nervous system, which is again a, a wonderfully modern idea, mathematical models of how the nervous system or the mind works. That's it's, it's kind of remarkable, and so there's there's great, um, uh, you know, I think I think just the the reach of her mind is interesting um, and, and quite fascinating. Um, she going back to the Manabria paper. One of the points she made was that um, not a, a computer could do a whole lot more than simple mathematics, as in symbolic computing, but a computer in the end could only do what it was told to do. And this is a, uh, again, a kind of remarkable point, because this is something people debate even now, like what can computers think and spontaneously generate thought and this kind of stuff. And, and she says, with great clarity, it can only do what you tell it to do. And there's a lot of evidence that that's the case. I mean, we, we don't have computers now that do spontaneous thought. Um, they, they may appear to do that, but in the end, it's some algorithmic process that's creating that. And this idea came forward, and it reached Alan Turing, the great sort of theoretical uh, father of, of computer science. And in um, 1950, he wrote um, uh, his paper about um, the Turing test, uh, which he called the imitation game. And this is a, a slightly different topic, but the idea was that you could, he, he was posing the question, can machines think? And he said, well, we can't really answer that question, so let's see, let's pose another test, a task to, to to, that can be a kind of proxy for that. And the task was, well, um, if we can have a conversation with a machine that makes us think that machine is a human, then that's demonstrating at least the appearance of thinking. And in the, the paper is lovely. It's, it's, a, it's a, a very discursive, not terribly mathematical, charming uh, paper, actually. It, it is... If, if one wants to get a sense of Alan Turing, the man, I, I, I think that's the way to do it. I think read that paper. And as a part of that, um, he presents the test, makes the arguments uh, for why this might be useful, and then he presents a series of counter-arguments. And one of the counter-arguments is called Lady Lovelace's Objection. And Lady Lovelace's Objection uh, to the idea that a machine could think is what she said in the Manabria paper that it only does what it's told to do. And Alan Turing, you know, several hundred years later, uh, looks at her objection and says, yeah, that's pretty 
you know, that's pretty solid. Uh, some of the other objections, he talks about the ESP ex objection, for example, which is my favorite. I always like to talk about that. But, but the idea that if, if um, humans indeed are clairvoyant, that that clairvoyance is a part of an essential part of our communication mechanism. And so if we're, if we're trying to communicate with a machine, we can't be clairvoyant with a machine. And therefore, um, the, the test isn't valid. It's, it's a wonderful kind of whimsical um, um, argument um, that I think maybe tells us more about Alan Turing than it does ESP or clairvoyance. But in any case, the point here is that Alan Turing, at least, knew about Lady Lovelace and this idea of hers. So it's clear that Alan Turing was familiar with the Manabria paper and that he thought enough of it to include it in you know, one of his great works. Um, and, and so I think um, I, I just find those kinds of parallels interesting and um, very kind of reassuring. Um, so now, um, Charles Babbage uh, worked on his analytical engine uh, really from the time he abandoned the difference engine around 1831, 1832, started working on the analytical engine and continued to do that up until 1848. And he came up with numerous designs of the analytical engine, all of which survive today. And some have, have talked about or proposed possibly building um, one of those, although I, I think those process, those um, efforts are still very, quite nascent. Um, but um, once he kind of wrapped up the analytical engine, then he returned to the difference engine, and that's difference engine two. And that was one of his later works, and, and he started difference engine two in 1847. So he had been through the first decade of difference engines, then a decade of analytical engines, and now he was back to the difference engine. And that difference engine benefited from those years of experience and had a very a much improved design to the earlier difference engines, and that's the difference engine that has been reconstructed in modern times. Um, and so um, um, it was um, um, just so while he left behind the difference engine, he went back to it um, and, and essentially gave us a design that we could build, uh, which is quite nice. Um, and so um, Charles Babbage uh, was a, a puzzling man, a, a wealthy man, uh, a man who had essentially unlimited funding from the British government. Um, it said the amount of money that was given for the creation of the difference engine was equivalent to what it would take to build a battleship. Um, and so he had so many advantages. Um, he also had great ambition. He was a perfectionist. Um, and he had very little tact. Um, and I think he crucially failed to realize that by abandoning the difference engine initially and moving on to a next project, he presented the appearance of someone who couldn't provide deliverables. And, you know, that's something that if a government or organization is funding you, they want to see something, right? They want a thing that comes from that. And he didn't provide that. And so um, uh, he ended up in conflict or feeling great resentment from the British government uh, or to the British government with his um, engineer, um, even had a falling out, sadly enough, with, with Ada Lovelace um, and um, uh, was in many ways a, a rather um, unhappy figure um, as, as we look back on his life. He felt himself to be a failure because he had not built any of his machines. Um, and so I think he was aware of these kinds of these kinds of limits. Um, so, um, so 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 Charles Babbage and La Ada Lovelace very much worth some serious um, reflection on what they did. Um, the nature of Charles Babbage's vision of these wonderful machines, Ada Lovelace's vision of computing, uh, a, a brilliant sort of far-seeing vision. Um, and of course, it's also, when we think of Ada Lovelace, it's also important to remember the times that she lived in. Uh, this is the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s. Uh, women uh, had a very limited role in society. A wealthy woman uh, led a very privileged, kind of sheltered existence with very little expectation that she'd do anything. 
Um, and in fact, a lot of Ada Lovelace's work she did um, in a very low profile way. Her name is not on the Manabria paper. I mean, the translator is just listed by initials. Um, and, um, and so certainly she was operating in a very constrained environment while still doing what was expected of her, going to parties, getting married, having children, all of that. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, that's, that's part of um, uh, the appeal of her story is despite these obstacles, despite ill health, despite dying at age 36 of uterine cancer in a, apparently a rather dreadful, painful way, uh, she accomplished quite a lot. Uh, as did Charles Babbage, um, and they're they're kind of a, an, an in interesting, interesting pair. Um, so, the difference engine, analytical engine, takes us up towards the middle of the 1800s. Um, it may be worth reflecting on that in the United States we still own slaves. I mean, so so we're kind of you know, so so, I don't know, and, and England was off colonizing the world and so forth. Um, but we saw some significant developments in the 1850s and, and moving forward. Uh, in the 1850s is actually when we see the invention of the slide rule. And the slide rule became this you know, kind of pocket tool for engineers and scientists to aid them with calculations that really was used up until the 1970s and 1980s. Um, and so um, that became a kind of desktop, if you will, uh, appliance or calculator that uh, people could carry with them and, 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 um, and use. Um, by the 1880s we started to see uh, mechanical calculators that, more were, that were more reliable and were um, uh, commercial products. They were being sold and so we started to see the development of um, calculators that could do addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, would often print out paper uh, print out results on paper tape and even might be powered by electricity. By the time World War I came around uh, we had calculators that were electric and printing out results on paper tape, uh, sometimes um, um, you know doing uh, multiplication and division um, and so those were certainly available early, early in the 20th century. Uh, we also started to see the development of punched card machines and this um, uh, very much like what we see in Babbage's um, analytical engine, is where you represent a piece of data on a card with holes, and then you have some kind of a card reader that is able to um, uh, see, if you will, or read what is on the card and represent that internally in some device to typically do uh, tabulations or sortings or other kinds of operations. Um, one of the kind of landmark um, um, devices in punch card history is the Hollerith tabulating machine. Uh, Herman Hollerith was an employee of the U.S. Census Bureau uh, who uh, developed uh, a punch card machine that was intended for use by the census. He kind of um, branched off and created his own company. And the 1890 census in the United States was done using Hollerith's tabulating machine. And this was important because the country was growing to a point where it was taking almost 10 years to calculate the results of a census. So you, you wouldn't really want to start, uh, you, know, you know, have the 1880, 1880 roll around and still not know the results of the 1870 census. And so, so mechanizing the counting and calculation of the population was important. And in fact, that is required. You can't just say we're not going to do a census because it's beyond our scope, because that's written into the United States Constitution, that there shall be a census. And why shall there be a census? Well, that's, be that's how representation in government is determined, how many people live in a particular state or district. So a census is a big deal. Um, and so the, the Hollerith tabulating machine is a, is a, is a, a wonderful looking device, uh, essentially a kind of a desk with um, uh, a, a sort of a board uh, um, facing you with a bunch of dials on it. And then on the desk there's a card reader where you, you can put a card in and then close the top of the card and the tabulating machine will see what is on the card and then increment the dials representing certain values on, um, on that desk, if you will. Um, it, would also, it also had a card sorter uh, so that when a card was read, the, the appropriate bin in which the card should be put uh, would um, have its lid automatically lifted and so a, a human operator could put 
a card into the card reader, see the dial move, and then file the card away. Um, the card reader functioned, uh, it was electric, and it functioned, um, it used mercury, actually. And so there were these little pools of mercury under the card reader. And so if, if a probe would go through a hole in the card, it would connect with the mercury and create an electrical circuit that would, um, depending on, on what combination of values were set, would send a signal to increment the appropriate dial or dials and also to open the appropriate door in the sorting bin. Um, and so, you know, mercury, as we know, is a, is a toxic, very toxic thing. Um, and so um, I don't think mercury was used for an extended period of time, but at least in that day it was. Um, and so the 1890 census was done by Herman Hollerith's um, tabulating machine, by his tabulating machine company. Um, and um, uh, he also was involved in the 1900 census. Um, Herman Hollerith's company, along with a few other companies, ended up being uh, merged together uh, to create what became known in the 1920s as IBM. Um, and so um, IBM, as we know, is one of the kind of, you know, monumental companies in the history of computing and technology and business and so forth. And that's where it began, I mean, really, with this kind of Herman Hollerith and his tabulating machine. Um, and so after, um, once um, Herman Hollerith and the tabulating machine had, had kind of run their course. Um, IBM, or its predecessors, uh, were creating electronic or electrical office equipment that would, a, a lot of it had to do with sorting and counting data found on punched cards. And what kind of data might you have? You might have like customer data. You know, like customer Bill Smith bought $4 worth of, um, you know, mercury. Uh, on July 21st or something. And that would be represented on a card. And you would want to keep track of your customers and what they were buying, how much they were buying, and things like that. And, um, and this became really one of the central um, ways in which business functioned in, in, in this country and in the world. Um, and so the calculating um, and office equipment industry was, was booming. Um, in the 19, 1920s, 1930s, you had IBM and Remington Rand uh, were kind of going head to head, creating electronic office machinery. And one of the characteristics of these kinds of devices that was important is that they were they were not really programmable, but they were often controlled by plug boards um, or control panels, where you could essentially pull out wires and move them to different locations to get the machine to do something else. That's not really what we consider to be a modern definition of computing, but it's something that became a feature of early computers and early computing, this kind of plug board idea. And so that goes way back to the 1920s, 1930s, those early days of office automation equipment. Um, so, um, so we find ourselves approaching the 1930s quickly, suddenly. We've, we've raced along here. And um, a lot was happening in the 1930s um, in the world, science, mathematics, culture, all over the place. And f for the purposes of history of computing and understanding computer science, computer architecture, one of the major figures is, of course, Alan Turing. Uh, Alan Turing, um, born 1912, died. 1954, um, and he committed suicide. Um, he was almost 42 years old. And so everything we're going to talk about with Alan Turing, he did in a very comparatively short life. Um, and um, uh, makes his accomplishments all the more remarkable. Um, but we can, really, we can really break Alan Turing's life, his working life, into three pieces, three sort of different periods, one right following after the other. And the first um, it represents his theoretical contributions to computing, which are huge. Um, the second period is during World War II, where his contributions to code breaking and, and really the, the preservation of, of England as a, as a country and, 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 and winning World War II are enormous. And then after World War II, he became very much involved in the, in the development and building and creation of
um, some of the first stored program computers. Um, very important work. Um, and, and so he had, in that short time, a very full career of, of both theoretical and practical uh, applications of, of computing, I mean, and uh, building, um, building computers. Um, and so really quite a remarkable life. Um, the theoretical work uh, began uh, uh, when he was a student at Cambridge University at King's College, and he began there in 1931. Um, and so, um, you know, was the typical kind of 19-year-old college student. Um, and in the, in the spring of 1935, in one of his courses, I think taught by Max Newman, um, he was introduced to Hilbert's decision problem. Now, David Hilbert was a mathematician, a more, more senior mathematician, who um, wanted to get mathematics on a firm theoretical foundation. And so he proposed a series of problems that he kind of exhorted mathematicians to work on. And one of them was his decision problem. And that has a German name like Enschugen's problem, which embarrasses me to say, because so, I can't say it, but we'll call it Hilbert's decision problem. And the idea was simply asking the question, is there a mechanical process by which we can evaluate a mathematical statement to see um, if it's provable or not. And by mechanical process here, what he means are a set of steps that a human could go through. It doesn't mean like a machine, but just a, an algorithm, if you will, to, to decide that. And um, this was um, one of the questions he posed. Um, I think Hilbert and many others presumed the answer is yeah, it's probably yes. We just need to figure out how to prove it. Um, but Alan Turing started looking at that problem, and by 1936 had concluded that, um, that no, there, there isn't such a process. There can't be. Um, and this was a finding, um, along with Gödel's incompleteness uh, finding, uh, that, that really kind of shook the conventional foundations of, of mathematics as understood at that time. Um, and he did this at all of 24 years of age. Um, and uh, uh, so it's interesting because Turing's work had impact both in mathematics and then the, even the non-existent field of computer science. Um, he showed a mathematical proof that showed that the decision problem was not, didn't have a solution. Um, and um, he, um, uh, in order to create that proof, um, designed or conceived of the Turing machine, or the universal Turing machine, which is a theoretical construction that turns out to represent anything that's computable. And the idea of the universal Turing machine uh, ends up being sort of the theoretical foundation of the stored program computer. And so it's almost like the side effects of his mathematical proof um, um, they don't outshadow the, the proof, but, but they had their own important impact. Um, now it's important to say that Alonzo Church, um, mathematician, had reached a similar conclusion about the decision problem a little before Turing. And Turing was quite worried about this, but it was kind of a different sort of proof and didn't have, um, Alonzo Church's proof did not provide this kind of theoretical foundation of computing. So at least in terms of computer science, we tend to focus on Turing's result, although it's important to say that Al uh, Alonzo Church had the same kinds of understandings of the decision problem as Alan Turing did. Um, so um, a little bit about a little bit about how he um, went about um, um, solving this problem and how this leads us to the universal Turing machine. Uh, Turing, um, in his proof, identified a, a new class of numbers that he referred to as computable numbers. And, and he showed that these were enumerable, meaning that they could be counted essentially, one, two, three, four. They're essentially a subset of the integers. Um, and he used um, Cantor's method of diagonalization to set up a proof by contradiction um, to show that Hilbert's decision problem couldn't be solved. Um, and so what he did um, was pose what became known as the halting problem. Turing didn't call it that. But he posed a problem basically saying, well, I've defined this kind of abstract 
class of machine, my Turing machine, which he didn't call a Turing machine either. We've called it that later. But I've defined this abstract machine, and um, I'm going to um, ask whether or not, based on the rules of that machine, if I can know ahead of time uh, if that machine will ever halt or not, or ever start, ever, ever stop running, given its current configuration. Will it reach a point where it goes no further, or will it just continue forever? That's kind of the halting problem. Um, and what, what Turing did was he showed that um, his Turing machine uh, could be represented as a set of integers. So you have essentially a kind of abstract computer represented by a set of integers, and it could take another Turing machine as input because they're just numbers, right? And that's where we see the stored program concept, the idea that data and instructions are really the same. They're the same things, and we can store them together and treat them together. We see that very much here in Alan Turing's paper and his proof, where the input to the Turing machines is another Turing machine. And the, the, the problem that he tries to answer there is, well, uh, can I process this other Turing machine and say that this other Turing machine is going to halt or not a priori, you know, before running the machine? And, and his conclusion was, he, he assumed, well, yes, I can, but then he showed by um, proof of contradiction, proof by contradiction that it could not be true. Um, and so it's a kind of a, a very elegant and, and clever uh, proof. And certainly it's, it's important to have some sense of the, of the proof, um, which I haven't really described in enough detail here. Um, but it's also important to remember it's not just the proving of the decidability problem that matters. It's the, it's the side effects, if you will, of the Turing machine, uh, the halting machine, the halting problem, and the stored program concept. All very big ideas um, in computing. Um, so that is all happening around 1936. Um, in 1938, Claude Shannon um, showed how uh, logic could be implemented using circuits um, and, and gave us the idea of a bit and many of the fundamental ideas of computing that we use now. Um, and so there was a lot happening on the theoretical front. There was a lot happening also on kind of a practical on the practical front as well, the engineering approach. And it's pretty clear that the the, the people building machines in the late 1930s were not terribly aware of the theoretical work, uh, which isn't necessarily surprising. Those are different kinds of communities, and it sometimes takes a while for um, theoretical results to percolate over towards um, engineering and so forth. Um, but by, by 1937, we had a number of efforts to build electronic uh, calculators and computers um, in, in both the United States and Europe. Um, and one of the earlier, uh, earlier uh, examples is a project at Bell Labs, uh, led by George Stibitz. Uh, and this was um, a machine that would essentially, uh, it was essentially, it was a calculator. It wasn't a, it wasn't a programmable computer by any means, but it was a calculator that worked with complex numbers, uh, imaginary numbers, which was a, apparently an important kind of calculation for Bell Labs to uh, carry out. And um, he, on his own, in his kitchen actually, I think, uh, figured out how to, how to build a, a small adder, a, a logical circuit that does addition, using electromechanical relays. Now electromechanical relays were used all over the place at the Bell Telephone Company because that was kind of the foundation of telephone switches and so forth. But he intuit, intuited that he could use those to represent logical circuits um, because the electromechanical relays really are just um, passing a current through or not. Um, and they're called electromechanical because the, you apply electricity to them that activates or deactivates when it's off a magnet that um, controls the flow of current. Um, and so, um, so he began to realize that he could implement a calculator, uh, not just to do addition, but to do mathematical operations on complex numbers using electromechanical relays. Um, and um, he struggled uh, uh, a little but decided in the end to, to use binary arithmetic, something we take for ex granted in computing now. But at that time, 
binary arithmetic was not, people didn't use that much or know much about it, and so it wasn't an obvious choice. Um, his device uh, had a price tag in 1937 dollars of, of about twenty thousand dollars, and it was um, about eight feet by five feet, uh, eight you know eight, eight feet tall, um, five feet long, one foot wide, and um, it could ho operate on two complex numbers at a time. So it was essentially a calculator, and it was ba made from these electro electromechanical relays, and also had input um, um, and um, I believe output via teletype. Um, and so, and it was capable of doing about five operations a second. So this is a fairly swift little device. Not a little device, but fairly swift. Um, and so that's an early example of an electromechanical calculator uh, that, that, that's quite important. Um, almost at the same time in Germany, um, uh, we had Conrad Suse working um, very much in isolation. Um, I mean, first, uh, this is not just Germany, this is Nazi Germany, um, and, um, you know, the tensions in the world are certainly erupting, and, uh, you know, Germany is, uh, um, you know, maybe becoming increasingly isolated, increasingly warlike, and Konrad Suss is in the middle of that trying to build a computer. Um, and so he... Um, uh, began working on these projects in his home as a student in his parents apartment I think in about 1935 and by 1938 he was developing um, computers that were actually they were programmable computers and it's 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 possible to make a pretty solid case that that Conrad Suse um, you know was essentially kind of the inventor of the um, programmable computer um, the one caveat to that is that his programs did not support branching. His computer did not support branching, and so they were just sequential or serial operations, which is quite a limitation. Um, so, so that's not what we would consider a stored program computer. Um, but uh, it also becomes a good way to recognize whether or not a computer is a stored program computer or not because branching in a stored program computer is very natural. Um, you don't have to, um, you have both instructions and data in memory and so to move in the locate, to move around in your program, to jump to a new location simply involves loading a different um, instruction uh, in your memory not maybe the next one, but one that comes at a different point in your program. And it doesn't involve any kind of physical manipulation of anything. And so if you have a machine uh, that uh, doesn't allow you a clean way to do branching, it's pretty likely not a stored program computer. Um, and so, so that's kind of an important thing to think about. Um, he was very determined to support floating point arithmetic. Um, and. Uh, had a very interesting way of, of specifying his programs. The programs were specified on 35 millimeter film, uh, which if you've ever seen 35 millimeter film, it has little kind of notches on the edges, and so it can be spooled through things, and then you can imagine kind of a code being written on that to provide instructions. And so um, a very innovative sort of approach to specifying the program. Um, his, his computer um, could hold 64 words of data, uh, in memory, and it was made primarily of relays. Um, there were two components to it, each of them about six feet tall, um, three feet wide, one foot deep, if you will, and they consisted of about 2,000 relays that would essentially serve as the memory and computing components of this device. And it could do about two operations a second. So it's a little more general purpose than George Stibbett's device, and a little slower, but still two operations a second is, is pretty respectable. Um, slightly after uh, Conrad Seuss's work, uh, we, we turn to the United States and we, we find another isolated figure actually, uh, John Atanasoff, who was at that time a professor of physics at Iowa State University um, in Ames, Iowa. Um, and uh, uh, he was isolated perhaps both by geography um, and perhaps um, inclination, I'm not sure. Um, but his work was not widely known at the time, and it wasn't really known until it became part of a kind of major litigation regarding 
the patenting of the idea of a computer in the 1970s. He was kind of rediscovered. Um, but he worked on a computer um, with his student Clifford Berry called the ABC computer. I don't think, we don't think he called it that, but that was the name he gave it. And um, this was in like starting in 1940 and became operational in 1942. And this was not a programmable computer. This was a machine that could solve uh, problems in linear algebra. So it was a special purpose, you know, calculating device. Um, and uh, it was um, important, though, for its use of the vacuum tube. Um, this was one of the first machines where we see a vacuum tube being used instead of an electromechanical relay. And vacuum tubes are faster. Um, electromechanical relays, there's physical movement of parts that's a lot slower than a vacuum tube where you're, you're really just moving electrons back and forth. Um, and so um, his, um, his machine, again, the scale is big, six foot by three foot by three foot. Um, it had, like Zeus's um, device, a capacity of about 64 uh, words. Um, and um, included uh, both the use of vacuum tubes and also capacitors uh, is how he implemented his memory. Um, and he used binary as his underlying representation, uh, which, which was an interesting choice. Not everyone used binary, as we'll see. Um, so I mentioned this patent litigation. And what happened was that um, John Mockley, who we'll talk more about as we go along, John Mockley was very interested in computing. He was likewise a professor of physics on the East Coast. And he um, heard of Atanasoff's machine and went to visit Iowa State in uh, the summer, I think, of 1941. And exactly what happened during that visit is not totally clear, but it's certain that he saw the ABC machine, saw it running, and became inspired by that. Um, and uh, um, I just mentioned that now, kind of file that little fact away. We'll get back to it as, as time moves on. Um, Likewise, um, another project, again in this time, right before the start of World War II or at the beginning of World War II, uh, was the um, Harvard um, Mark I um, project led by Howard Aiken. Uh, and this is a project that started around 1937 and delivered an operational computer in about 1943, 1944. And the Harvard project was really interesting because it was first an electromechanical computer. It, um, it, it is really sort of the crowning glory of the electromechanical age. If you recall, Stibitz's uh, device, um, rather small in scope um, and uh, not terribly costly. Um, the Harvard project um, was big. Uh, it was programmable, but it likewise had no branching capability. So again, we can say, OK, a programmable computer, but not really a stored program computer. Um, it's the fact that it's programmable is where we uh, where we meet or find Grace Hopper, another kind of iconic figure in computing, one of the one of the earliest of the programmers of the electronic age. Also, a woman, a Navy officer, uh, retiring as a rear admiral, I believe. Um, and a, a, a very um, inspiring figure. There's an there's a, a organization and conference named after Grace Hopper now that again tries to kind of promote and, uh, the interests of women in computing. Um, and so um, Howard Aiken was an interesting uh, man. Uh, he is one of the few people in computing to really mention Charles Babbage as a kind of inspiration. And he actually referred to this uh, computer as a computing engine at times. And, um, and, and one of the goals of the Harvard project was to um, be able to automatically print tables of results as Charles Babbage wanted to do. So I think to some extent he, he tried to style himself as a little bit of a successor to, uh, to Charles Babbage. Um, and as a result brought a little attention to Charles Babbage, which isn't a bad thing. Now Howard Aiken um, and Harvard entered into the creation of this computer with the IBM Corporation. And IBM invested Five hundred thousand dollars, five hundred and fifty thousand early World War World War Two dollars. So that's a whole lot of money, and the 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 computer, as I say, was electromechanical. So it had like three thousand relays, um, and it had 
2000 counter wheels. Um, it had kind of a turbine. And so indeed, you can see some connection to Babbage's in vision of computing as this more kind of electromechanical um, device. It was big. Um, it was 51 feet long, um, 8 feet tall, and um, 8 feet wide, so kind of a long, very long rectangular box. And um, it could store 132 digits in memory. Um, and uh, uh, Howard Aiken originally started this project uh, with the goal of evaluating integrals. So we see here Zuse, floating point arithmetic, Stibitz, complex arithmetic, uh, arithmetic with complex numbers, um, Howard Aiken, computing integrals, John Adonassoff, computing linear algebra problems. These are the kinds of problems people needed to solve. They were important problems, right? There are a lot of important problems that um, revolve around those tools. But then remember Ada Lovelace and symbolic com computation and, and uh, music and all the rest, uh, calculus of the nervous system and so forth. Um, so the, um, uh, the, the Harvard Mark I uh, project and Mark II project is what these computers were called by Harvard. IBM called them the ASCC, and for reasons that are unclear to me, um, IBM, the, the, the computer was constructed at IBM's Endicott lab and then delivered to Harvard, and Howard Aiken at that point seems to have kind of brushed off Harvard and sort of not wanted to continue any kind of partnership with them. Um, which, needless to say, would have been pretty frustrating for, for IBM. And uh, uh, IBM went off and began to develop their own line of computers, which perhaps they had thought they had already done, but um, apparently the agreements were such that Howard Aiken could kind of do what he did. Um, but I mention that because it's important to realize that IBM just didn't come out of the blue. Um, it will seem like it. At a certain point, you know, in the 1940s, 1950s, all of a sudden IBM is everywhere. And you wonder, well, how did that happen? And it's like, well, IBM has been a company since 1928, building office machinery, punch card machinery, um, and then enters into computing in the early days. I mean, Howard Aiken is recognized as one of the pioneers of computing, and he was sponsored and funded in part by IBM. Um, and um, uh, Howard Aiken was also a Navy officer, commander, uh, as uh, Grace Hopper was, and, and, and was supported by the military as well. And remember, 1943, 1944, World War II is going on, and so presumably perhaps a military officer could just kind of commandeer something and say, okay, thank you, this is for us now. Um, I'm, I'm speculating a little bit there, but, um, but it, you know, certainly um, Howard Aiken is an atypical, we don't find too many military officers in, in sort of the, the annals of, of computer architecture and history. Um, not that there couldn't or shouldn't be, but, um, but he is. And as I say that, of course, I immediately need to correct myself and say, well, Grace Hopper was a military officer too, so maybe I'm, I may be wrong about some of that. Um, and so the, the IBM, or the Harvard Mark I, we'll call it, um, was um, operational about 1943, and it actually stayed operational until 1959. So it was a high-ticket, expensive item, but it had a 15-year lifespan, um, where you know some of the other devices certainly did not. Uh, John at Nassoff's uh, computer, it's not clear how much or how long it ran, and um, Conrad Suse's computers were all destroyed in the bombing of Berlin at various times, and so um, um, we have kind of an exception here where computer lives on for a while. Um, so um, let's think a little bit now about where we're at. So we're, we're, we've entered the 1940s and the technology that was available in the 1940s for representing numbers and doing calculations, uh, there were a few options. Um, we had, you know, just mechanical gears, you know, you could have you know, like a Charles Babbage kind of approach. That was certainly available technology. Uh, we had electromechanical relays, widely used with telegraph and telephone, a, a well-developed technology, easy enough to go out and buy hundreds or thousands of electronic, electromechanical relays and then build stuff with them. Um, we also had vacuum tubes. And vacuum tubes uh, have been around since the early 1900s. 
Um, and these were widely used for radio and telephone ampli um, amplification. And so a well-developed technology. Um, and um, it's important to note that electromechanical relays, vacuum tubes, had been around for a long time and had found wide use in areas other than computing. And so for someone like John at Nassau to say, you know what, I can use a vacuum tube for this, it's, it's a bit of a, a flight of imagination. Um, to, to envision that because that's not how they were typically used. Uh, same with electromechanical relays and George Stibbets realizing, hmm, I can build circuits with electromechanical relays. Again, there's a bit of a, there's a, bit of a flight of imagination there. Um, and so if we look at uh, representatives, if you will, of, of computing devices that use mechanical gears or calculating devices, we go back to those early adding machines of Schickard, Pascal, Leibniz, and also Charles Babbage. You know, those are mechanical systems. Um, when we talk about electromechanical relays, the good representatives include George Sibbets and Bell Labs, uh, Conrad Suse, and his, um, his computers, the Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4 is their typical naming, Howard Aiken and the Harvard Mark uh, computers. Uh, these were electromechanical systems. Um, and then the vacuum tubes, we see John App Nassoff. Uh, we'll also, a little bit, in just a few moments actually, during World War II, see them used in the, in the, 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 the British uh, Colossus system that was used for code breaking. Um, and then after, during actually World War II and then after, we'll see vacuum tubes maybe most famously used in the ENIAC computer, um, uh, which we are getting to, we are getting to. Um, and so that's, what, that's the state of technology. The state of the world, 1940, uh, well, perilous, right? This is World War II. So 1939, 1945, World War II is going on and causing unprecedented levels of misery and pain and horror in the world. Um, and it affected some of our principles here, uh, certainly Conrad Suse working and living in Berlin uh, and, and losing his computers to, to bombs. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, it's, it's nothing compared to the loss of, of life, of course, but still an unfortunate occurrence. Um, Alan Turing uh, redirected from his theoretical work into code breaking, which he did voluntarily. Um, one thing that Alan Turing should be credited for is a voluntary return to England. Uh, he was in Princeton in 1937, 1938, Princeton, New Jersey. And I'm sure could have easily stayed there, you know, kind of brilliant mathematician, let's keep him safe, that sort of thing. But he chose to go back to England. And he chose, um, and I think was to some extent recruited, to, to, to work on code breaking, and actually reported for duty at Bletchley Park where the code breaking work was done the day after England entered World War II in September 1939. Um, and he stayed there throughout. He was there for the duration. Um, World War II also had a tremendous impact on the funding of computing and the priority of computing. And certainly in the United States, there was a tremendous need for firing tables, artillery firing tables. And so if you are uh, firing one of those big guns, you know, the big, you know, barrel, um, you know, lobbing large shells, long distances, you can't target that just by intuition or kind of eyeballing it. You have to do it with some precision. And the way in that day that it was done is they had firing tables that would tell them, given a distance to a particular target, and you being a certain elevation, the target being at a certain elevation, the wind being a certain direction and certain speed, this is the angle at which you need to fire your artillery. Think of all those variables right there all of a sudden. So for every different kind of position, every different distance, you needed a new artillery table, uh, a new firing table. And these were created by hand. So this is Charles Babbage's worst nightmare, right? Not only are we doing it by hand, we're possibly introducing errors. And if we have an error in a firing table, guess what? Shells go where they shouldn't. Um, and again, catastrophic. I mean, this is, this is life-threatening. Um, and so... The military uh, had a strong desire and need for rapidly computed artillery firing tables, tables on demand essentially. And so they began to fund 
uh, computing efforts. Uh, it, it, um, it could take several days to compute, uh, you know, s uh, artillery firing, uh, you know, th these tables, um, and and that's not going to work in a big, fast-moving, uh, um, you know, insane war having a bunch of people sitting around desks working out calculations and then putting them on airplanes to send them off to the front. I mean, it just, it's, 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 it's not, not feasible. Uh, but that's what they had to do. Um, and so um, the Harvard Mark I system, uh, Howard Aiken in charge, was certainly involved in military applications um, and funded by the Navy, I think, as a result of that. Uh, we also see now the uh, ENIAC computer, the University of Pennsylvania. John Mockley and J. Presper Eckert um, began working together, began conceiving of electronic computers. Remember, John Mockley took his trip to visit uh, John Adonassoff in Iowa um, back in 1941, came back inspired to work on computers, met J. Presper Eckert, they formed a partnership and began the ENIAC project with significant funding from the U.S. Army. And why? Because of these firing tables or ballistics, ballistics tables. And they used um, in the ENIAC, remember the Harvard Mark I was electromechanical, uh, the ENIAC was vacuum tube and they wanted it to be fast, you know, really fast. Um, so that was motivating a lot of developments in computing in the, in the United States, actually, these military applications, especially artillery uh, firing tables. As the war went on, um, the calculations required for the development of atomic weapons became important as well, and so both the Mark I and the ENIAC were um, envisioned as assisting in that. Um, the Mark I was operational during World War II. The ENIAC was not. And so while it was envisioned as contributing to these efforts, it unfortunately didn't. Um, in England, uh, perhaps the priority was on code breaking, and in particular the German Enigma code. Um, this uh, was the, uh, the Enigma was an encoding or encryption device that the German military had used actually, I think since maybe the 1920s even. And uh, it was a very effective code. Uh, hard to break, and um, in particular, in the early days of the war, uh, German U-boats, the submarines, were causing havoc. Uh, England, Britain, an island nation, of course, dependent on shipping, and German U-boats um, acting as predators um, and sinking ships, causing the loss of military cargo, military personnel, civilians, um, and it was really quite a crisis. Um, and, and the U-boats were hard to find, they were hard to track, and well, their signals between the um, German Navy command and the U-boats were intercepted, they were encrypted, and, and they couldn't, that information wasn't useful. Um, and so Alan Turing was um, put in charge of what was known as Hut 8, which was charged with breaking German naval codes, most particularly for the U-boats. And um, Alan Turing spent about 20 months working on the Enigma code for U-boats and finally broke it in the summer of 1941. Not a moment too soon uh, because that the, the effectiveness of the U-boats was ferocious and England was being brought to its knees um, because of lack of supplies, lack of military material, lack of food. A lot of this coming from the United States. Um, and, uh, and so a loss of British uh, ships, American ships, Canadian ships. Um, and the breaking of Enigma was a, a massive advance, a massive step. Um, and um, the 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 British um, had several different kind of computational approaches for helping them with this. One of them, Alan Turing, was directly involved with and I think essentially invented, and this was the idea of uh, uh, what he called a bomb, although it was spelled B-O-M-B-E. And this was a special purpose um, computing device that would um, uh, take 
uh, they would they would kind of guess what certain strings of characters might be encrypted on encrypted as um, or be encryptions of based on common stock German phrases you know like Guten Tag or Heil Hitler or something like that and they would use those as clues and then set a bomb to the Enigma settings that would um, correspond with um, you know, if, if this is encrypted, if this is the encrypted form of Heil Hitler, then this is how Enigma must be set. And then they would run that and then try and find a decryption. And there's quite a lot more to it than that. But that's the basic idea. And it's, it's actually a very modern sounding process. This is how a certain amount of statistical NLP and especially translation proceeds by, by recognizing certain kinds of um, known pairs or cognates or common words and finding their translations and then sort of bootstrapping off of that. So it's kind of a, a, a fascinating uh, parallel I, I find there. Uh, and so the bombs were very special purpose electronic devices. I'm, n I'm not sure that you would even call them computers, but you know, that's besides the point. This was about breaking codes and stuff and winning a war. Um, there was also a, a machine, uh, the Colossus, which was a computer. It was programmable. It was a special purpose computer, however, just geared for breaking codes, which again makes perfectly perfectly good sense. If you're in the middle of a war, you're not going to worry about, oh, I need to generalize this. You need to get the task at hand done. And that's what um, Colossus did. But it used vacuum tubes. It took paper tape. Input came as paper tape. And so um, it's very much like the computers that we would see, the general purpose computers coming out that we would see in the 1940s and 1950s. But Colossus was largely unknown. It really wasn't until the 1980s or even 1990s that we started to get details about Colossus, and that's because it, it stayed classified. And that might seem kind of baffling, like, well, why would you keep a World War II era computer classified for 30 or 40 years? And well, part of it was that the Russians, uh, the Soviets, we should say, continued to captured some of the German cryptographic equipment and continued to use it after World War II. And so the British already had machines that would deal with that. And so they kept, they kept it, they kept using it. And the same thing, uh, apparently the East German um, Stasi, the secret police, uh, continued to use Enigma into the 1960s, knowing full well that, yeah, sure, it had been been broken, but um, relying perhaps on um, the fact that maybe there wasn't a, a, a willingness to go through that breaking process again. Um, so kind of some interesting and kind of fascinating developments. Um, one of the sort of great overlooked heroes of early computing um, is a man named Tommy Flowers, who was very instrumental in the creation of Colossus, and I think uh, apparently uh, was somewhat bitter about the lack of recognition Colossus got um, as compared to ENIAC. ENIAC was classified during the war, but fairly quickly declassified, and um, uh, not the case with Colossus. Um, so, um, also because of World War II, uh, we meet uh, another famous mathematician, uh, John von Neumann. And John von Neumann uh, was a kind of man about science, uh, involved in many different projects, and was in the United States. Uh, he was from Hungary, I think, but had uh, come to the United States and was working on behalf of the United States government. And he was involved in various different projects, including uh, the Manhattan Project, where the atomic bomb was being developed, and um, was imagining computing devices that would help with the calculation of everything you need to know to properly detonate an atomic bomb. And he became aware of the ENIAC project and began to visit and consult with them. Uh, he also um, commissioned uh, some um, uh, calculation on the Harvard system for Los Alamos and so forth. And, and so, so John von Neumann kind of comes on the scene and starts getting involved with the ENIAC. Uh, which which leads to some considerable controversy very quickly. Um, John von Neumann uh, uh, died relatively young himself, age 53 in the in the 1950s. Um, uh, I think it's believed uh, from cancer caused by exposure to radiation um, because of his work with the Manhattan Project and so forth. So 
uh, another kind of heroic uh, effort that uh, that he paid a, a very high price for. Um, but uh, uh, in any case, um, uh, so we see rapid technological advances. We see the emergence of, of some key personalities: John von Neumann, uh, J. Pressburger, John Mockley, Howard Aiken. Um, all of these people kind of coming to the fore uh, during uh, World War II. And Alan Turing, Alan Turing, not so much coming to the fore during World War II because he was working in sort of top secret isolation. But immediately after World War II, he kind of reemerges onto the com onto the computing scene. Um, so, um, so what can we say about the ENIAC? Um, the ENIAC is a significant machine, significant computer. It was the first general purpose programmable computer. Um, it was not, however, a stored program computer, um, meaning that it did not keep instructions and data in memory together. Um, but it was programmable, it was general purpose, and so is distinct for those reasons. Um, now when I say it was programmable, it wasn't easily programmable. The ENIAC used essentially a plugboard approach to programming where you have to rewire it. And remember where we saw that idea. We saw that idea with the IBM office equipment essentially. And so, um, you know, clearly there's an influence there. Um, and so, to reprogram the ENIAC, you had to rewire it. And before you could rewire it, you needed to figure out what your program was. And apparently programming was really ferocious. And you would, you would work on your program on paper, and it might take weeks to do that. And then you give the program to the wiring crew, if you will, and they would rewire the machine. Um, the programmers and the rewirers, I think, were in fact the same people. And interestingly, um, those early programmers um, and setters of wires, if you will, were women. Uh, there were six women uh, involved in the ENIAC project who were the principal programmers. So it's kind of a, you know, a, a, it's, a, it's kind of an unfortunate thing that that sounds surprising to us now, just given the, you know, the rather poor numbers of women in computing. But if we look back um, uh, to, to this period, programmers on the ENIAC project, all women, uh, Grace Hopper, uh, significant figure, not only with the Harvard Mark I project, but just computing in general. Um, Ada Lovelace, you know, uh, as well. So uh, interesting sort of contrasts. Um, the um, ENIAC was a vacuum tube computer. It had 18,000 vacuum tubes. And um, for memory, um, J. Presper Eckert actually developed a new approach to memory called the mercury delay line, which for a period was quite popular. And the idea was that you would represent a value with a signal that was sent through a tank of mercury. And that signal would cause waves, and the waves would represent your data. And then you could, you could keep that waveform moving around the mercury delay line. It, was either, it would either be in a circle or kind of a tube. And you'd keep that value moving around. So you'd put it there, and then it would stay there circulating around, and you could read it later. Um, and so it's kind of an intriguing notion. Um, and so the ENIAC used mercury delay lines from memory. Um, the total price tag was about $500,000, mostly coming from the United States Army. And um, it, could, it achieved 5,000 operations a second, which was breathtaking. I mean, remember the figures we were talking about with some of the electromechanical machines are single digits of operations per second. Um, this is 5,000 operations a second. It occupied 1,800 square feet and required 150 kilowatts of power. So this was a big, you know, resource-intensive machine. Um, and uh, it did not become operational until February of 1946. And this was after, you know, it was hoped that it would be operational during World War II. Um, but it became operational in 1946 and actually stayed operational until 1955. So almost a 10-year period of working. And it, it was uh, moved fairly early in its life. ENIAC spent most of its life at the Aberdeen Proving Ground, uh, which is a military site. And so it did, in the end, serve its purpose of military uh, applications. Um, just not in the time frame that they had anticipated. Um, so um, the ENIAC, as I mentioned, was not a stored program computer. Um, 
and the ENIAC, uh, the successor project to the ENIAC was the EDVAC. And remember I mentioned John von Neumann began consulting with the ENIAC project in September of 1944. And that included figuring out ways to use the ENIAC and then working on kind of ideas of how to make the next generation of ENIAC, if you will. And that was the EDVAC. And so on June 30th, 1945, John von Neumann um, published what's called the first draft of the EDVAC report. And he described in there, in actually a very elegant, precise way, the stored program, a way to implement a stored program computer using this fetch execute cycle we've mentioned. And he described it in sufficient detail where this became a blueprint and a roadmap for people trying to build stored program computers around the world. Now, he only listed himself as the sole author. The explanation for that that he gave later, I think, was that, well, it was just a first draft. Um, but I think J. Presper Eckert and John Mockley felt um, more than slighted. And um, the effect of this paper was such that the stored program, uh, the stored program concept is now often referred to as the von Neumann architecture not the Mockley-Eckert architecture, not the von Neumann-Eckert-Mockley architecture, um, but just the von Neumann architecture. And um, if you hear or see videos of um, Eckert-Mockley talking about this, it's clearly had an impact on, on them and their lives and, and, and just you know feeling unrecognized. And um, it's unclear, though, um, Mockley and Eckert fell a little bit into the trap of Charles Babbage and didn't write things down. And they were a little slow to file a patent for the ENIAC. And so, in a sense, um, while John von Neumann's motives and so forth may have been perfectly reasonable, he was an academic. Academics like to publish things. They like to get ideas out there. Mockley and Eckert were not necessarily thinking along those same lines. They were thinking, I think, more in terms of creating companies and, and having patents and so forth. And so um, a little bit of a culture class there, uh, cult culture clash. And so, um, so the, um, whether or not Mockley and Eckert understood the stored program concept um, before the publication of this uh, EDVAC paper, I think it's pretty certain they did. Um, and, and so the exact, you know, who contributed who and whose ideas what or, or what is, is a little unclear, but, but the fact of the matter is John von Neumann wrote it down and he gets credit. This is not unlike a little bit Ada Lovelace. She wrote it down. And so the moral there is write stuff down. Um, you know, especially if you're concerned about getting credit for something, write it down, you know, uh, somewhere. Um, so the EDVAC, uh, the EDVAC project continued, and that was developed at the University of Pennsylvania, became operational 1951. Uh, Mockley and Eckert left uh, Penn quickly after ENIAC became operational. I think the university may have realized they had a potential moneymaker on their hands, and so they changed their essentially intellectual property um, policies to give the patent to the institution and not the inventors. Mockley and Eckert felt this was unreasonable, and so they left. They left in March of 1946, and so the EDVAC project continued without them, and Mockley and Eckert went and formed the Eckert Mockley Computer Corporation. Now, they did not write or file a patent on the ENIAC for several years after um, doing this, and you know, perhaps you can understand that they're going through this tumultuous time. Uh, first, John von Neumann is off publishing papers without their names on it. Then their university is trying to essentially take what they feel is theirs in terms of the patents on ENIAC. Um, and so, obviously, and they were starting a new company, and they were preoccupied. And so, um, uh, so once, once John von Neumann had published the EDVAC paper, this was a significant event because this really kind of started the race to develop the first stored, stored program computer. Morris Wilkes at Cambridge in England uh, was certainly um, very interested in the paper, very interested in developing a stored program computer. Alan Turing, after World War II, went to work at the National Physical Laboratory and began working on a stored program computer uh, called ACE. Um, 
And we had numerous groups in Manchester. Max Newman was leading a group uh, trying to develop a stored program computer. And you had um, various projects in the United States. EDVAC wanted to be, EDVAC was going to be a stored program computer. I mean, that's John von Neumann's design, right? EDVAC was going to be a stored program computer. And um, John von Neumann at Princeton working on um, a system that sometimes is referred to as IAS, Institute for Advanced Study, um, which is where he was, again, trying to get to a working stored program computer. And there were some technological challenges, um, but the race was on. Um, and um, the race was uh, initially won uh, by a group, at Ma Max Newman's group at, Mar at Manchester. They ran the first stored program computer program on June 21st, 1948. And they did this on a machine that is sometimes called Manchester Mark I, which is kind of confusing because that's the same name as the Harvard system, or, or also, Man also known as Manchester Baby. And so this was the first time a stored program a computer had run a program. Now the machine itself was still not stable and so it wasn't a continuously working machine. Um, that The honor of sort of the first stored program computer that was up and running continuously belongs to Morris Wilkes actually who achieved that on May 6, 1949 with the EDSAC system. And the EDSAC system was a vacuum tube machine again uh, it had um, about uh, 1K of, of RAM, um, and or 1K of not, I shouldn't say RAM, but just able to store 1K, uh, 1K were a thousand words, and it used mercury, mercury delay lines actually as its storage medium, and was able to achieve about 714 operations a second. And remember, that's quite a lot less than the ENIAC. The ENIAC hit 5,000, so the ENIAC, you know, was kind of exceptional. Um, but the EDSAC was the first operational stored program computer, and that happened in 1949. So by 1950, we start to see the stored program computer um, on the scene. Now, um, Alan Turing uh, was working on a stored program computer called ACE. Um, for various reasons, was not successful. The institutional support seemed a little murky or a little... A little um, difficult at times, and, and Alan Turing himself perhaps maybe wasn't the person to lead a project like that, but when he learned of Max Newman's success in Manchester, he more or less went immediately to Manchester. He left NPL and went immediately to Manchester to start working with a stored program computer because he was fascinated, and well, he should be. This was his idea. I mean, the universal Turing machine come to life, and so the lure was ir irresistible. And so ACE was eventually implemented, but not by Alan Turing. Um, he was up in Manchester. Um, Alan Turing, though, in his work on ACE um, and, and thereafter, uh, he had a very clear design philosophy where, where he wanted to do as much in software as he could and, 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 and not rely too much on hardware. And in fact, he made a rather, a rather cutting comment about Morris Wilkes' work back in 1946, I guess early versions of the EDSAC, saying something to the effect of the operating system is a bit different, more in the American style where you solve problems in hardware and not with thought. So a little, a little dig there at both Morris Wilkes and, and the whole of the United States, but uh, we'll, we'll allow Alan Turing that. Um, so uh, Mockley and Eckert uh, created their uh, Eckley Mockert Computer uh, Company, Computer Corporation, uh, 1946. And they struggled. They were not really business uh, people, and uh, they uh, quickly ran into uh, financial problems and eventually um, sold uh, to Remington Rand in 1950. Now remember, Remington Rand was the big office equipment uh, company that was in direct competition with IBM in the 1920s, 1930s. Remington Rand stayed in the game, and Remington Rand was involved in the early days of computing, and in fact, they bought the Eckert Mockley Computer Corporation as a way to kind of bootstrap their efforts. Now, Eckley and Mockley and Eckert had secured the contract from the United States government for the 1950 census, which is a pretty big deal, and they developed the Univac. That was their first um, product, the Univac One, and, and that's an iconic name in computing. Now, you'll 
you know, ENIAC, Uni, UNIVAC, these are iconic names. And um, the um, UNIVAC was a stored program computer, and it, it data was kept on tape. Uh, so this is where we start to see those tape drives that you sometimes see in uh, early movies and things like that. And, um, uh, and so the UNIVAC, each UNIVAC cost about a million dollars, and uh, uh, Mockley and Eckert were able to get contracts for various numbers of machines, but because of their own lack of funding and, you know, you need a certain amount of startup capital to, to get a company going, they were just never successful with that. And so Remington Rand stepped in and began selling the UNIVAC. And um, in 1955, Remington Rand merged with um, Sperry, uh, which led to the Sperry Univac uh, company. Um, and, um, and the Sperry Univac company, of course, is a, is a, was a company in the Twin Cities here in Minnesota. Um, and uh, so it's kind of a hometown connection there a little bit. Now, Mockley and Eckert filed their patent for the uh, ENIAC uh, uh, several years after leaving the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and so uh, they, they filed, I believe, 1948. The patent was granted in 1964. And the patent was granted to um, Remington Rand, or, or and then um, Sperry, um, ha having done that merger, acquired that patent as well. And, and, and this essentially gave um, uh, Sperry Rand, a patent on the idea of an electronic computer. And, and they wanted to capitalize that on that and charge royalties um, for anyone using an electronic computer. And uh, this, um, uh, this contention was contested by other companies, among them Honeywell, another Minnesota company. And so 1973, uh, Honeywell versus Sperry Rand went to uh, went to court went to uh, here in Minnesota, and the finding was that the patent wasn't valid, and the patent wasn't valid for a number of reasons. But one of them was John Mockley's visit to John Atanasoff's laboratory in 1941, and this is where John Atanasoff is rediscovered, and this is where the patent on the computer was broken. And so there is no patent on the idea of an electronic stored program computer or electronic computer. In retrospect, that may seem appropriate. That, that seems appropriate because as we look at all of the figures involved, working independently, perhaps crossing paths, but there was, a, there was more so a, a community of people developing some of these same ideas at the same time. And it wasn't like a bolt of lightning uh, from that can be clearly attributed to one place. Um, we, we'll, we'll see bolts of lightning coming up here, actually. Um, the UNIVAC became kind of a popular, uh, popular in, in, in popular culture as well. Um, kind of famously in November 1952 predicted the, the uh, presidential um, election in the United States where Dwight Eisenhower defeated Adlai Stevenson. Now the fact of the matter is that wasn't a close election, so it wasn't maybe the toughest case, but all the same, it was an impressive demonstration of computing and, and a, a kind of novel application. Um, and so um, I mentioned bolts of lightning. Um, we get a bolt of lightning in 1947, and that's the invention of the transistor. That turns out to be a big deal. Um, and so remember, we've been talking a lot here about first electromechanical relays, then vacuum tubes. Now with vacuum tubes, um, you can picture them as a tube, of course, but on one end of the tube there's a, there's a little a cathode, um, and in the middle of the tube there's a grid, and at the top of the tube there's a plate. The grid is, or the, the cathode is heated, and electrons are emitted because of the heating. Electrons have negative charges, and so that grid, if it's given a negative charge, will repel the electrons. But if the grid gets a positive charge, it passes them through to the plate which collects them um, because the plate carries kind of a positive, a positive potential. Um, and so this is how the vacuum tube operated. You would send a signal by essentially controlling, uh, by controlling, that elect uh, controlling the grid, controlling the flow of electrons with the grid. And a transistor operates in much the same way, and that's not surprising. I mean, the original use of the vacuum tube was as an amplifier, and transistors were initially intended 
to be used as amplifiers, as indeed they were, and things like hearing aids and radios and so forth, transistor radios. Um, but a, a similar kind of principle applies where you have sort of an emitter, a base, and a collector. And the emitter has negative, char uh, negative electrons uh, that are either drawn in or repelled um, by that base. Um, and if they get through, they go to the collector. And um, very similar kind of principle, just done in a completely different media. Vacuum tube, you need a vacuum inside of a glass tube. Transistor, you need a semiconductor. Um, and the, as we know, the semiconductor of choice has become silicon. Um, and so there's a whole lot of uh, interesting details about how transistors and vacuum tubes are engineered and stuff, but it's important to remember that commonality between them, too. Um, transistors have the enormous advantage that they require much less power and they're much smaller. And so, um, and they're more reliable. Vacuum tubes can blow out and, um, you know, transistors much less so. Um, so 1947, the transistor was originally invented at Bell Labs, um, again. And then 1951, we see the introduction of the junction transistor, which, which was a somewhat easier to fabricate um, you know, kind of transistor, and so led to the commercialization, uh, the commercial use of transistors. Um, now, we mentioned IBM. IBM, um, sort of spurned by Howard Aiken, uh, IBM went to work. And uh, in March 1952, IBM entered the uh, computer market, the mainframe, as we'd call it, computer market. Uh, remember, we start to introduce terms now that refer to different classes of computers. And once we get to the commercial age, we start talking about mainframes. And these are big systems that are big in terms of size, big in terms of cost. And typically, an organization would, if they were lucky, have one of them. And that would take care of all their computing needs. So it was a mainframe, the mainframe for doing stuff. Um, and so the IBM 701 was uh, IBM's sort of entry into that mainframe world. And that, that took place March 1952. So UNIVAC was out there. And so IBM 701, let's compete now with UNIVAC. Um, this was a vacuum tube machine. Um, and it, uh, it could store uh, 2,048 words uh, in memory. And uh, the words were 36-bit long. So, um, you know, so you have a 36-bit architecture there. And uh, IBM began at that time their policy, which they carried out for many years, of renting machines. So you could sell a machine for a million dollars, or you could rent it. And certainly for a company, renting is probably more appealing because you don't have to come up with a million dollars. IBM 701 rented at $15,000 a month, and these are $1952, so that's a pretty big uh, amount of money. So the types of organizations that would have a mainframe would be big, prosperous companies, government entities, military, and so forth. Um, the, the, the memory, the RAM, was implemented in vacuum tubes, uh, I believe so-called Williams tubes, but then was frequently backed up to mag magnetic drum because vacuum tubes were still unreliable. They could still go out, and if they did, and they were implementing RAM, well, you would end up losing your data, and that would be kind of an unacceptable outcome. Um, so um, at the same time, another interesting company emerges uh, called Engineering Research Associates, ERA. And uh, that was based in the Twin Cities, St. Paul, Minnesota, and is important for a few reasons, one of them being that it was the first employer of Seymour Cray, the great computer architect who would go on uh, to design revolutionary systems that control data, and then at Cray Computing, um, iconic figure in computing. I got his start in Minnesota uh, after graduating from the University of Minnesota. And in December 1951, ERA came out with uh, a model uh, 1101. Um, and uh, ERA was acquired um, by Sperry, uh, um, and so that 1101 actually became a, a UNIVAC. Um, another of the UNIVAC line. Um, and the uh, reason for mentioning, though, Engineering Research Associates at this point is that in 1954, um, they used magnetic core for memory. And this was, this was a, another step forward. Um, instead of mercury delay lines, you had magnetic, magnetic core where you had, you know, little magnetic donuts essentially strung on wires 
and the, the, the position of the donut would basically correspond to a zero or one, and you could control that based on the charge that was passing through these wires. The magnetic core became the workhorse of memory up until 1970, when we start to see silicon memories. So, um, so this is a big deal. Um, and uh, 1954 is also the year that Alan Turing took his life. And uh, so just to kind of keep things in, in perspective here. Um, so what do we see now? 1945, 1950, um, in terms of memory, uh, we've, we see that um, the mercury delay line has become popular. Vacuum tubes are used for memory, uh, the Williams tube. Uh, we also have magnetic drums used for memory. And this um, is actually reminiscent. John Adonassoff uh, implemented memory using a drum with capacitors on it. And uh, ERA uh, was actually a pioneer in the use of magnetic drum memory. And, um, and then we, as we move more towards the mid-1950s, we start to see the rise of magnetic core memory. Um, there was still some debate and discussion about binary versus decimal representation, believe it or not. Um, the ENIAC was a decimal machine, interestingly enough, um, although binary would eventually prevail, um, especially um, you know, as we get um, towards building logic circuits with transistors and things like that. Binary really only makes sense. Um, but what we see in both the UNIVAC and the IBM 701 uh, is that there was a commercial market for stored program computers. And this obviously spurred the development of more and more of that. Uh, what was interesting about that is that there was, even then, even in the 1950s, great skepticism about the idea of a stored program computer. Nonetheless, no, no less than Howard Aiken uh, said uh, something to the effect that he just couldn't imagine that there would be a, a one machine that could solve so many different kinds of problems. And it's like, this is what Alan Turing showed us. I mean, this is what Ada Lovelace conceived of. And yet it takes people time to kind of start to accept these kinds of changes. Um, so that seems like a good stopping point for our first segment here, kind of a long segment. And uh, when we return, uh, we'll start to talk about this period in early 1950s where commercial computing really starts to take off and where we start to see developments with transistors and integrated circuits pushing technology forward and changing the market in ways that I think anyone in 1945 would, would hardly conceive of. And so um, we, will, uh, we will continue uh, and uh, hope to see you there as well. So thanks.